Hey guys, welcome to the Chasing the Roos YouTube channel. Uh, just, we'd just like to introduce a series called Beers with Brownie. So, I'm Brownie, and basically what Beers with Brownie is, um, it's a series where we interview a guest each episode, and that guest, um, is tell, we'd, like, we'd like them to tell their story about what they've done in International Rugby League, and their development work, and just highlight the, the pioneers, and highlight the people that have given up their time um, and to, to help grow our game around the world and just, just tell their stories. So we hope you enjoy. Thanks, thanks for uh, tuning in. Please uh, drop a like um, and subscribe to help our channel. And welcome to the first episode. Enjoy. Hi guys, welcome to Beers with Brownie. We're an international rugby league channel that uh, we focus on highlighting the unsung heroes of International Rugby League, people that have put their blood, sweat and tears into growing the game around the world. And this is our first episode. Okay, so in this episode, guys, I just wanted to show my support for the Papua New Guinea uh, Rugby League. Uh, it's the only country in the world where rugby league is a national sport. And I'd also like to show my support for the New Zealand Warriors. Um, so if it wasn't for their sacrifice for the game last year, it wouldn't have gone ahead as it did and it be a great success. So shout out to Papua New Guinea Rugby League and the New Zealand Warriors. Every episode I'm gonna have a different nation and a different uh, team to support. So thanks guys. I'd like to welcome our guest for this episode, former International Rugby League Development Manager, Taz Batiri. Uh, welcome to the episode, Taz. Thanks for, thanks, thanks for your time. Thanks for having us, Phil. All right, we're at the uh, Narrabeen Academy of Sports, where many moons ago I was uh, Taz, Taz's intern. So Taz, my first question for you. Uh, over the years, you must have had many interns come, come and work for you. Can you tell me who was your best intern and why was I? <laughs> Phil, what a great start. Yeah, you were, you were good, but you know what? Recently we had someone that was an intern just like you and progressed to become a uh, NRL referee in Todd Smith. So oh, wow. I'm going to have to say between you and Todd... It's going to be the to toss of a coin, mate. Well, sounds good with me. Uh, Todd, if you're watching, you know, fair up if you've been compared with me. So well done, Todd. <laughs> okay, so so every episode, we want to support a beer that supports rugby league. So our, our episode is Beers with Brownie. Um, so our beer that we've got today is Singer. And Singer, we're a sponsor of the 2013 Rugby League World Cup. Thanks for the sponsorship, guys. Good to see you, Phil. Not a bad drop, this one. What do, you, what do you think, Taz? Passes the test with flying colours. Uh, if you know any beers out there, guys, uh, for the viewers watching at home that have sponsored or are sponsoring rugby league at the moment, leave a comment because um, we're always looking for we're always looking to support uh, beer brands that sponsor rugby league. Rugby. Cheers. Okay, guys. So for those uh, tuning in, if we can get to one thousand subscribers. Uh, we're going to buy 100 footies to send out to developing rugby league nations all across the world that need these resources to play the game. If we can actually get to 10,000 subscribers and we can monetize this channel, we want to fund a domestic competition in the Solomon Islands. So guys, make sure you like the, ch like the channel, uh, subscribe, and please, please spread the word because all the, all the money that we can make off this YouTube channel, we want to give back to the game and, and help promote the game around the world. And what a great course for some great countries if you can do it, Phil. Okay, so Taz, tell, tell us how you came to love rugby league. Phil, um, I was a, a migrant kid from Blacktown, Italian parents, and uh, Dad always thought I'd play tennis. But going to school uh, at Blacktown uh, at a Catholic college, um, we were persecuted back then a little bit, you know, having a, an Italian name like Bortolo Batiri, difficult to say, and coming to school with uh, mortadella sandwiches or prosciutto sandwiches, Whereas the Aussie kids had Devon and tomato sauce. So there was a bit of a rival fighting between the immigrant kids and the Anglo kids. Got, got to um, be baptised the Tasmanian devil by the nuns because I was a devil with all the fighting. And ta Taz stuck as the name, but then I became, I, I, wanted, I needed to play rugby league so I could be on equal footing. And I started at 11 to play rugby league back at school at Patrician Brothers College Blackdown. And then I, uh, I ended up playing and finishing when I was 35 years of age in the University Cup competition here in Sydney. Fantastic. Okay, for, for, those, that, for those that don't know, you played for the uh, Penrith Panthers, Canterbury Bulldogs, and also had a stint over in Paris. Uh, tell us about what that was like. 
The stint in Paris obviously um, changed my life. Um, I left Blacktown as a 23-year-old with a bag and uh, ended, up, uh, ended up staying in France, in Paris, for 10 years. And when I came back, I came back with a wife, three boys, and it contained a load of um, homeware, homeware to restock the house. So the Paris uh, club uh, was called Chatillon at the time and had never won a game in uh, Elite One, First Division. Right. My first game with them was against the team that was coming first. Uh, we ended up getting beat 6-4. Wow. And, and the team was that happy because we only got beat 6-4. And I'm saying, how come we're, uh, everybody's so happy? So they, they were carrying on like they won the grand final. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> but it was just amazing. And that was the first experience for me coming from, from Sydney on how the game is played abroad. And, and France has always been a strong rugby league country, has been, when, if you go back in history, the, the 50s and the 60s, and even the 70s, they would give Australia and England some pretty good battles. But today, um, it's a different, and we'll probably talk about that later, but um, my time in Paris was unbelievable. I met my wife there, had my children there, and, um, and then I brought them back because I think Australia is still the best place in the world to bring up your family. Well, I know there'd be a bit of a, a culture shock, culture difference there, but I've always wondered why the NRL don't look at some of the best French kids to come over. Um, and I was actually having a conversation with a recruitment manager the other day, and they've actually got their eyes on two young French 16 year olds so that'd, that'd be revolutionary, revolutionary for the game if we had some French stars join the NRL. We've always had a trickling of people that would want to come to Australia and and see if they could cut the mustard. Um, some have. Um, Jerome Kisay yeah, and Remy Casti. Absolutely they, they've demonstrated that put them in the same environment they can also perform at the same level. So I think that's all that, that, that's needed. So if kids that are identified as with potential come here and start in our junior rep program, 16s and 18s, and they maintain that disciplined way of life, because here it's very disciplined, you know, what you eat, um, recovery, training, skill work, and if it's done at the same level, well then those boys will progress the same way as our Aussie boys do. Yeah, absolutely. Just put them in the right environment and they'll thrive, and it can only be a positive for, that, for our game having stars from all over the world. Well, look at how not simple Fijian boys come across here and are very, very raw. We've got that many great Fijian wingers and centres, not many, a oh, couple of forwards, but no hooker or, or halfback. And, and that's probably an area the game needs to try and fix up, yep. especially with people coming to Fiji. And now having a Fiji team playing in the, the Ron Massey Cup pretty soon this year, that'll be a way to uh, open the doors there. So it's absolutely fantastic for the game. and. Uh, for those that don't know, I played for Fiji in 2005, and when I played, there was two NRL players. I think it was, I think we had uh, Eparam and Navali, and uh, Wes Nagama was a reserve grade at the Dragons at the time. And now, when you look at the Fiji inside, it's just full of NRL stars. Um, so when I played, it was we were a lot of us were semi-pro, Jim Beam Cup level, some local A grade level. So it's really come a long way in just a short space of time. So it just can really show being in the right systems can really. Sure. Yeah, really progressed and it's going to be great for the game. And we've also got a lot of, um, or not a lot, but we've got a number of French players that playing the Super League team in England with English clubs and in a similar environment to what they would be here in Australia. So, And they're progressing really well too. So we, we need more of that type of development for France to become a powerhouse again. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so Taz, just going back to when you played in the elite rugby league competition, playing for Penrith and Canterbury. Who was your favourite player that, that you played alongside? Well, my favourite player I played alongside, it was funny you say that, Phil Gill and I were uh, close buddies back then. We played at Penrith in the under-23s. Right. We went to New South Wales University together and we used to drive our cars and try and see who would win the race from New South Wales Uni to Penrith for training. Um, I'm glad there were no radars or highway patrols back then. <laughs> I did get picked up a couple of times, but all in all... Uh, Phil and I were pretty close back then in, in those days and we played together at Penrith and it was a great time of my life, I can tell you. Oh, fantastic. No, it's just, I, I remember a time where, do you remember a player called Jason King? Big unit, played Manly, played at Manly, played yeah, New South yeah. Wales. Works at the NRL too, Jason King. Oh, I didn't, didn't, yeah, didn't yeah, even know yeah, that. Yeah. But um, so, so we were playing here, my team, North Curl Curl Knights, were playing in St Augustine's and he was playing for St Augustine's who were probably under 16s but he was about the size he was when he played NRL, he was a giant. It kicked off to my side. He ran from the back fence, 
and I was lucky. I played alongside a. I was playing uh, centre at the time, and my second row was a guy called Lee Morrow, who was uh, Vic Morrow's older brother. Who Vic Morrow, mm -hmm. for those that um, follow the NRL, he played for Manly, and. I was. I closed my eyes. I, I. I was shitting myself. I was just praying that I. You know. I. I, I come out okay of this tackle. He's run off the back fence, 100 mile an hour, and Lee Morrow just shot out of the line, absolutely belted him. And I looked. I closed my eyes. I looked up, and he was on the ground. And I was just going, "Thank you." So. <laughs> so I mean, um, he was one of my best players that I played alongside. But um, yeah, like so, there was players like that that, that you know that you're glad they're on your team and they weren't absolutely amazing. So um. So, so who going going on the opposition players? Who was the most feared opponent when you played in the elite competition? Jeez, back then, um, Craig Young at St George. I mean, I'm going back, you know, to the late late seventies and early eighties. Um, even Ray Price at Parramatta. Um, Just tough as nails. Oh, even the Balmain boys, um, Blocker Roach and Kerry Hemsley and PC at, at Lock. You know, there's some tough guys, and they're still tough in the in the modern game today because they didn't give any quarter or take any quarter. So the Jeez. battles were good. So when I when I started watching rugby league and I, I saw Mal Meninga line up for Canberra, I, I felt sorry for the person that had to mark him. So, you know, they, there were some some fierce opponents back in those days, and there still is, obviously. But okay, so Taz, later in your career, you became the French national coach in 1986. Um, what was that experience like? Um, how many matches did, did the team play, and what were the results? So, Chatillon, my team in Paris, we won the competition in 19. 85 and got promoted to Elite 1A. It was divided in A and B and, and there was sort of 16 teams in the top group and 12 in the bottom. Anyway, I won the, we won the comp that year and it was, I had um, two Australian players with me. One was Paul Fields, comes from the country, played State of Origin a few years earlier. Paul and a fellow by the name of John Maguire, right, yeah. who was our fullback type centre. So there was three Aussies in this Team of ours, the rest were all French kids, and um, we played Australian style footy. You know, uh, I was captain coach at the time. So, winning the competition, the president of the French Rugby League back then was a fellow by the name of Jacques Sopelsa. He was a Sorbonne University chairman or chancellor. He, he ran the university, and he was the chairman of the French Rugby League. And we were we met each other at the French Rugby League office one time in Paris, and he says, um. You, don't, you did good with Chavillon. Um I wonder if he can do that good with the, with the French team. And I said, well, Jacques, you never know. <laughs> Why are you going to give me a job? So, yeah, he offered me the job. I had a two-year uh, stint with the French Rugby League. We played um, New Zealand in my first test series. In Marseille and Perpignan were the two test matches. We lost both games 22-0. to zero. And the likes of the Sorensen brothers played in that game. They had a Howie Tamati. Some great... Great forwards and great plays. So we lost those two series, 22-0. Uh, then I played England, home and away series. Had a draw at Carcassonne. So that's pretty good. It was 10-all. And then we got Not beat bad. at Leeds. It was 20-10. But, um, yeah, so had four test series, matches. Well, I think if any French coach in the modern era today had those results, he'd be happy with that. Yeah, the, the, as I said earlier in history, the French were... They, they set the scene, actually, you know. A lot of people talk about the 1950s and 16 team where they all, always would um, win the Test Series against Australia. They were tough buggers, all people from the land. Yep. And even against the English, they always this traditional rivalry across the channel. But since the sort of the 80s, the mid-80s, and, and the Super League Wars come about, the game hasn't sort of progressed as anyone would like. And back then, there was only five countries that played the game, if, if we go back to 1985, yep. you had New Zealand, Australia, Papua New Guinea, France and England. And today we can boast about having more than 50 playing the game. So the game's evolved a fair lot, yep. but it's still revolved around the professional leagues here in Australia and the Super League in England, which is probably something that's been a, a hindrance to our evolution when you compare ourselves to cricket, rugby union and soccer, for example. So as, as a keen expansionist, um, you know, I was a big fan of the Toronto Wolfpack experience um, and uh, adventure, so I should say. Um, so Paris Saint-Germain come in the league and you were appointed the CEO. So tell us about that experience. So it was about 1995-96. Um, the Super League War had started. Um, Australia had its Super League competition and the ARL had its ARL competition. England went 
across the Super League and they needed expand, to expand the game they thought bringing a French club in would be useful. At the time, um, Beans, no, it was TF1, I think, or one of the major networks in Paris was a keen supporter and follower and broadcasted the Paris Saint-Germain Soccer Club. Right, okay. So we ended up having talks with the soccer club where we would have soccer and rugby league use the same field yep. so everybody would benefit having sport played 12 months of the year. Because Super League was a summer sport and soccer was a winter sport so everybody could use the facilities and there would be not too many dramas. There was a lot of uh, French plays in that first Super League um, side that we had in 1996, I think it was. So what would you say the percentage was, 75-25 to import? Uh, no, we probably had 80% 80, 80 French and 20% and Australian. And those Australian plays came from clubs that played in the French competition at the time. Wow. And the, we, I think we avoided getting the wooden spoon the first year. Um, finished 11th year. We won the first game in Paris. We had 18,000 spectators. Wow. We played Sheffield Eagles, Gary Hetherington's team. I remember that. Who now is a lead. remember that game. Yeah. Massive. And, and, and if you had a... If you were a member of the Paris Saint-Germain Soccer Club, you had access to the Paris Saint-Germain Rugby League Club. Wow. And, and we got a, a huge following there on the opening game. We had fireworks. We had everything that we have nowadays. Yeah. It was really massive and it really set a tone of how, how important rugby league could be in France if it was managed correctly. Yeah, that was huge, huge potential. And just going back to Toronto for a second, um, you know, I, I was privileged enough. I went to Toronto three times. I got to meet David Argyle, and um, I was just, I, the potential for rugby league in North America is huge. Um, just showed what they achieved in four years. And I could imagine, uh, you know, if rugby league was, you know, had the right resources in France, it could do the same over there as well. Absolutely, and I think you talk about resources. The game was very strong in the 30s and the 40s, and then the war came along, and, they, and it was very, very popular. It actually overtook rugby union in terms of popularity and even wealth because they had good crowds at games, income was coming in, good sponsorship. And then through the war, the Vichy government at the time, a lot of, um, a lot of, the, a lot of the research has demonstrated that there were a lot of rugby union people in senior positions within the Vichy government. And all they tried to do was suffocate rugby league out of exi existence. Took a lot of its assets, its clubs, a lot of things were closed down, they were, they were forbidden to play. They even took away the name of rugby league. And they said, the only thing you can call this sport is Game of 13. So it's called, it was called Jua Tres back then. And then it had a court case in the mid 80s with Jacques Sapelta where he tried to get the game reinstated to rugby 13, so, which, is, which it is today. So what was their motive for doing all, all of those acts? I think the people in the Vichy government at the time, in the rugby union, people saw the potential that the game had and how it dominated and overtook the, rug, the 15 code at the time and thought threatened, I'd imagine, and then tried to do everything they possibly could to um, annihilate them. And then there's been a lot of research done and a lot of books have been written about the forbidden game yeah. or the forbid, forbidden sport of rugby league in France. And um, they, they've suffered a fair bit. And, and they, I don't think they've recovered because of it either. Rugby union became very dominant and it's still a very wealthy sport in France. You know, uh, when, when you see the French competition and they play this European Cup as well now. Mm. It's massive. And I think it's discriminated against the rugby league a lot. We don't get a fair share of media coverage or newspaper articles or even TV um, reports, even though the um, Tres Catalan plays in the Super League, very very minor articles about rugby league. And they won the Challenge Cup two years ago. You think you'd, you'd set the world on fire yeah, yeah, for France rugby league. So equivalent if, if Sydney Swans won the AFL, you'd, it'd be all over our media over here. And Absolutely, and everybody would be wanting to play AFL, exactly the same. So Taz, after your playing career and after working at Paris Saint-Germain, you ended up at the New South Wales Rugby League Academy. So how did that all come about? Well, I've been, I, I have been in the game uh, as an administrator or as a player even. When I went to France, I mean, the reason why I ended up getting the roles I did was because France was the only non-English speaking country at the time. And being, you know, I, I ended up marrying a French girl, I, I, my French is very, it's good. So when meetings were on and the five countries would meet, 
I'd go along and be the translator for the French president, All right. uh, Jacques Sapelza, who was uh, one that respected protocol in France. He would only speak in French at a board meeting, wow. and then Taz, you better translate. <laughs> and then when the Aussies or the Kiwis or the English spoke back, or the PNG chairman spoke back, they'd still speak in English and then I'd have to translate to Jack in French. Wow. But Jack was was fluent English, he could speak it and write it perfectly, but because of this protocol system, you know, we're in France, we've got to speak French, we've got to read French, you know, Jack was the way he was, and, and it gave me that opportunity to be with the power brokers of the game at the time. Ken Arthurson, John Quayle, David Barnhill, so I got to meet them, uh, and, and they knew a bit of my history anyway, because I played in Sydney anyway, in the, in the Winfield Cup competition back then. Yeah. So I ended up coming back to Australia and um, I knocked on Ken Arthurson's door and I said, listen, Ken, I'm, I'm back home. Uh, is there any opportunities um, about? And he said, just be patient and um, you'll get a start. And then within within 12 months, I ended up getting a start here. Not, not here, but actually in Melbourne as a development officer for the Victorian Rugby League. Wow. Because the Australian Rugby League were expanding the game. Victoria was a target. The Swans were in Sydney, and we've got to have a team in Melbourne. And we had State of Origin in Melbourne, I think it was 1997. Yep. And Tina Turner was, was here, and she'd done the, the ad with the, with the players. And I think it was 81,161 was a record crowd for wow. rugby league in Australia. Amazing. Set at the Melbourne Cricket Ground back then. Wow, in 1997? Correct. Wow, fantastic. Just a quick side story, Taz, um, about, the, about the French uh, chairman speaking French and when in France, got to speak French. Yeah. So I, I uh, lived in London for 10 years and I did make a fair few trips to France. Uh, I ba I'm very basic in my French language skills, uh, maybe four years at, at the high school. And I went to Paris and people were warning me, my first trip, they were warning me saying, you go to Paris, they're going to be really rude, they don't, they don't like foreigners, they're really rude. And, but I found them to be the most lovely, loveliest people. I went into a coffee shop. I tried to order in French. They obviously knew I was a foreigner. Uh, they spoke back to me in English, and they were just the most loveliest people. But I think, I think they just want you to try to make it. Yeah, they do. They yeah. do. They do. And the more you try, the better off you're going to be because they see you're making such an effort to to try and communicate with them. And in the back of their minds, they could probably understand more than fifty percent of what you're saying, but still want you to do. You've got to do it the French way. You're in France, you've got to put the effort in, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. And it doesn't matter where you go to, like, especially when you know eating and drinking in France is, is a big industry. Yeah. It's gastronomic cuisine. And uh, if you go to a restaurant and you start speaking in French, and then the, and the waiters always, they've got to be bilingual because there are so many tourists that go there. And English is always a second language for any other nationality. Yeah. So they, they take the cue and if you do come down to their level, they love it, they appreciate it. And then they they open their hearts and to you. Yeah, no, France is it's up there with uh, some of the one of the best destinations I've ever been to. Great country, and I was lucky enough to go and watch a game in Toulouse. And I think that club for anyone from Toulouse that, that is watching, I think you've got a lot to be excited about. Um, very great, you know, great things in the pipeline for them, and hopefully Super League around the corner. So. Why not? They need it. They need it. They definitely need it. The Catalan Dragons um, are, are doing some good stuff. But at the same time, there are not enough French players in the Catalan Dragons team. There's got to be more. There are lots of English players now, and the Shrek, Israel Flowers there now, uh, Maloney's there now. Greg Bird spent four years there, I think. And he's still there coaching the reserve grade side. So there, there's all, and there's been a, a transition of a lot of players that have gone in and out of that club. But it, it, it's just failed to develop a system where they'll identify good potential young athletes. Mm. Even if they're rugby union background, because not everybody can play rugby union. Either your size isn't good enough, or you can't pass left or right, or whatever it is. But there are a lot of players there, and we just got to be able to tap into the right ones and, and have our own rugby league academies developing good players. Well, one thing, one thing as a fan, um, an outsider looking in for, to the Catalan Dragons, uh, your most important position in rugby league, in my opinion, is your spine. So one, six, seven, and nine. And if you ever look at the Catalan squad, they they're not they're not French players. So when it comes to the national team, so they might have great props, they might have good back rowers, might have a good winger, but their spine they don't have any French players playing in the elite level. Um, where that's a problem where I think they need to fix going forward. 
You're right. Um, at the moment, there's a quality little sort of half five eight in in uh, Pascal Farge. No, Theo Farge is from St. Helens. Plays at St. Helens. So he comes from PA, which is a suburb of Perpignan, and uh, he's one of the leading uh, Super League players. Like a kid like that, well, you need more kids similar to Pascal or Theo. Sorry, his father's Pascal. Right, <laughs> Theo. To, yeah, to, to learn, to learn the skills, and they've got to be given the opportunity. And right now, the problem in the game is everybody wants a quick win. They've got to have wins. They've got to be on top of the table. And to do that, you've got to buy good players. So the good players are either out of Australia or in England, and they don't give the, the French kid enough time to develop, become confident. Uh, weight training, recovery, diet, uh, the psychology of the game. Um, yeah. Things that you already know about, anyway. So, Taz, you've worked uh, with a number of international rugby league um, teams, um, you know, governing bodies, uh, tournaments. Does any stick out for you over the years? Well, I tell you what, a tournament that was not on, never on the radar, but the, the Russian rugby league managed to get an invitation for rugby league to be an exhibition sport in the Youth Olympics. And it would have been 98 or 99, 98 or 99. And I thought, how good an opportunity would this be for rugby league to be present at the Youth Olympics? But only, we're only a demonstration sport because, you know, you know we don't win gold medals or Olympic medals. Yep. So but this, de this demonstration sport would have been a way to get our footprint into the IOC. Yeah. So, being a little bit crazy, I've come back and talked to some people here at the Academy at the time. And we ended up having three teams from Australia, under 16-year-old kids, that left Australia, uh, went to Moscow, did visa process, passports, you know. It was in July, which was good, so it was summer. Yep. So we didn't have to take any heavy clothing or there's no snow about. And we got to Moscow and then we had the French came, Italy came with a team, out of Australia too, actually. Then Scotland played, Ireland, I think Wales. So we had eight teams. So anyway, from a, an event from zero to be able to achieve eight teams, three out of Australia, and Queensland won, by the way, they ended up going through. Queensland played New South Wales in the final. Wow. But, the, but just to get 16-year-old kids to go all the way across to Moscow, where you think the game would never be played, yeah. and be part of a, this Youth Olympics, and then everybody got a certificate of participation at the Youth Olympics, that's probably the start of, of a journey where we did multiple trips after with young young people, young players, and um, developed a lot of great players that have turned out to play for the NRL ever since. Wow, that's fantastic. Um, and yeah, a lot of these kids never they would never have imagined them playing playing in downtown Moscow. Correct, so, correct. Yeah, wonderful. Um, so one of my memories, Taz, when we, we went to uh, up here in Samoa for the was called the South Pacific Games, now called the Pacific Games. Correct. In 2007. Uh, very memorable for myself, um, as that was the first time Rugby League Nines were involved in, the, in, in this event. Okay. Uh, so how did that all come about? So you, 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 we might go back 20 or 30 years, we weren't around in the game back then, but Rugby League was a, a sport played in the Pacific, South Pacific Games. There's about 23 countries in the Pacific that attend the South Pacific Games. When you say it was played, Taz, was this 13 side? Yeah. No, 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 sorry. No, no, uh, not, no, it would have been 13 side, yeah, because, because it was. Because I think this was the first nines tournament, wasn't it? Not first, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well, Rugby Union played sevens, we played nines. Yeah, it was a modified version of the game. Right. Because it was in a quick turnaround, too. It's over a two-day event. Right. And you can't play 13 aside and bash each other up for 80 minutes of football. But, yeah. So we had six teams that year in um, in Samoa, and we resurrected the rugby league as a sport in the Pacific Games. And I can remember that we played Samoa in 07, then we went to Cook Islands in, in, in 2009. Then in 12, we didn't play because it was in a country where we didn't have rugby league. Right. Then we played in Papua New Guinea in 15, and then 19, 2019 again in um, Samoa, or was it 18? Anyway, they're on four-year cycles as well. Yeah. But the last time we played the games in Samoa, we had um, the first time women's competition as well. Yes, so we saw had that. Eight men's, eight men's teams and six women's teams. Great event. 
and, and it will mean that the next time that the Pacific Games run, and I think they're running the Solomon Islands next time, where both men and women will participate as an official sport and a medal sport wow. at the Pacific Games. Wow, that's fantastic. Uh, no, I, just, I just remember in 2007, I went, went over there and uh, met a young Casey Badger, was uh, refereed at the final, um, and I was, I was the linesman. Um, you know, half Fijian, so I was good that Fiji won the gold. But um, no, it was just a fantastic experience, and seeing rugby league on that stage was was fantastic. Great media um, exposure for the sport. Uh, no, it was, it was just it was just fantastic to see. And do you think rugby league can get into more events like this, like the Commonwealth Games, um, Arafura yeah. Games, all these type of um, events? Just before we finish on the Pacific Games, it also gave an opportunity to new countries like Vanuatu and Solomon Islands to participate, who aren't you know, staunch rugby league countries like Papua New Guinea, Tonga, Samoa, Fiji, Cook Islands. So the Vanuatu and, Papua, and uh, Solomon Islands play the game now, and it's it was introduced to them by, by our... exactly, exactly, and they've attended now twice. So it's a major event in the Pacific that sort of unites all these countries, and they play the sport that they want, and and it, and it's great. But I think you know we've started with the Pacific Games. We've now We've had the two Commonwealth Games, so one in Glasgow and one in Brisbane. Yeah. And during those last two Commonwealth Games, rugby league was offered the opportunity to be a demonstration sport. So we weren't played, we never played rugby league at the Com Games. We played a month before it started. So we were like a, a test event right. with the venue, timing, buses, security, use of the field, training with the clubs or the teams. Yeah. So in in, in Glasgow, we had eight teams, and then the, the games in Brisbane, we had eight men's teams and six women's teams. Wow. And that, and that was lucky, or that was, that was, we were able to do that then, because the International Rugby League Federation uh, gave us a grant of about $100,000 to help cover, you know, better travel, uh, meals, accommodation for the teams, because it was an expensive exercise. Yeah. Because the four British Island teams came down and played, and then we had Australia, uh, Papua New Guinea, Tonga, Samoa, and the Cook Islands play. Right. Well, it might have only been three from the Northern Hemisphere. But anyway, we had eight teams. And it was a great event uh, at Redcliffe Dolphins Club yep. uh, on the Sunshine Coast. And um, yeah, it was great. And, and we need to keep doing that yep. to, salute, to, 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 make, to enter the Commonwealth Games as a, as a medal sport down the track. Right. So Birmingham is the next games, yep. and I hope that rugby league um, go in as a demonstration sport again. Is there a minimum amount of countries that need to play the game to be a Commonwealth Games medal sport? No, I don't believe so. Um, I think, you've, for, for example, for the Pacific Games, you've got to have a minimum of six teams. Yeah. So if you don't have six minimum of six, you can't play, yep. or you can't play for medals. Right. Uh, but I don't think there are any restrictions with the Commonwealth Games because it's all Commonwealth countries anyway. So if you play rugby league in, in your country and Australia does, hopefully we'll be able to become a medal sport down the track. So I remember, I remember as a young kid, um, the World Coca Cola World Sevens was yeah. a way to introduce new uh, countries to play the sport. Yeah. So I remember Japan were involved, South Africa, Morocco. Um, and as, you, as you've touched on, Taz, the Pacific Games has um, introduced Vanuatu and Solomon Islands. Solomon. So if we can get into the Commonwealth Games, do we dare to dream for the Olympic Games one day? I think the Olympic Games uh, is something that's very congested. Lots of money is required. Short events are fine, but if you have a, a third in a side tournament over a month, well, you can't really, it's, it's unaffordable. So I think, and, and I don't know whether another code similar to ours would accept us into the Olympic Games. Right. There's always that rivalry, so... But I guess tennis can't stop table tennis from being an Olympic sport as... No, know, no, so. sure, sure, I know, but sometimes um, there's a fair bit of politics involved and yeah. uh, the people on the round table tend to call the shots and um, it's difficult. We've been trying, put it this way, we have been trying, but we've been trying with no success. Yeah, no, fair enough. Fair enough. Okay, so just moving on in your career, Taz. So later, later on, you were appointed as the RLIF uh, development uh, manager. Yep. So what 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 uh, tasks were involved in that role? Well, 
if you like, there, there's always been, there's an increasing demand for our sport to be played around the, the planet. Yeah. And that demand has, comes from people now moving around for work or study and are bored, they've got free time, probably don't want to play any other sport other than rugby league, whether it be touch, footy or tag, but rugby league. Yeah. And, and it, it's grown organically where people just want to play league. So what do I do to set up? And we've got a footprint now in, in almost 50 countries via that. Wow. Or people have seen the game on television and said, well, how, how good is that game? The Americans say, well, how can you crazy Aussies be colliding with one another without any protection? Yeah. Somebody's got to get hurt. Yeah. But I mean, that comes from proper training as well. So now the game's evolved since, since I started doing it. And um, I started in Europe when I was in France for those 10 years. I was European development manager back then. And the likes of Holland were playing, Germany were playing, Russia started playing, the Ukraine were playing. I was doing stuff in Morocco. Hussein Mbaki, who you probably remember out of London. Well, we went and had a uh, lunch with yeah, uh, yeah, Hussein in London. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So Morocco were playing. And now a lot of Central African countries that are very Francophone countries because France dominated that region back in the wartime. Yep. They're starting to play the game. You know, we've got Nigeria, we've got Kenya, we've got Cameroon, we've got Burundi. Ivory Coast, I saw. Ivory Co Côte d'Ivoire, yeah. yeah. And uh, all, everybody, there's a lot of posts now regularly of how the game's evolved in Central Africa, but they need they need help. They need foot, having a football with a, a critical element in playing the game is foreign. They're, they're poor economies, they're developing, they don't have uh, money at the drop of a hat to go and buy footies. And when you buy a footy over there, it's, it's massive because it'll, it'll come out of Asia, there's transport costs. So uh, an element like a football to play the sport that you want to play is critical in starting the game. And that's probably one of the resources that we tend to, to ship out. We have, um, we have, we've been doing sort of a Christmas hamper or a box where you might get a, th six bottles of wine in the box of wine, I'll take out the wine and we put in half a dozen footies and then ship them out. So we've been shipping out to Brazil, to Argentina, to Belgium, wow. to Morocco, to Cameroon, to Russia, even to some parts of northern, northern Australia where people just can't get equipment mm. in some remote communities. South Africa, um, India. Ind India for me right now is just waiting to be over, overtaken by the game. At the moment, we've got the test series at cricket. Yep. And a lot of our cricket is a mad footy players. Yeah. And, and we've got a footprint in India where they, they played a tournament two weeks ago. Yeah, I saw that. With nearly two billion people, the amount of people in the country, let alone, it's, got, it's going to have, we're going to have more Indians playing the game than we've got playing around the world right now just because the sheer numbers. Well, all it takes is 0.01% of their population to enjoy rugby league and you have a massive fan base. Absolutely. So, and for all but those... Gonna, but sorry. That's right. But our strategists need to realise that you've got to go fishing where the fish are. There's nothing wrong with the Pacific. There's only three million people in the Pacific. Like the little dots on the planet, on the ocean, but but it's not where everybody is, it's not where the fish are. Yep. You add in Papua New Guinea, you've got 11 million. Yep. Fiji's probably the next biggest country after Papua New Guinea with 1 million people. Everybody else is, Cook Islands is 13,000 people. Yeah. Tonga's 100,000. 100, Samoa's 220,000. India, nearly 2 billion by 2025, 2 billion. You can't tell me that we shouldn't go there. There's plenty of body shakes. And I, I don't know if you saw some of the vision from the Indian carnival down yeah, there. Pretty, pretty there were some great, great talented players there. Absolutely. And we've got to focus on going into new markets. And India for me and maybe China down the track, which is how Super League started. We we're going to take the game to China. Yeah. Uh, is also another marketplace where we can tag into some new athletes. Well, an, an argument, Taz, uh, is that... So I, I'm, I'd love to see a Perth NRL team and a Wellington NRL team and people say, oh, there's not enough talent to go around. But uh, personally, you know, I've, I've played rugby union in Singapore, I've played rugby league in England, I've played in France, I've played in Italy. And, like, there's so many talented players out there. They just need to be, like you said, you touched on before, they need to be in the right environment, the right systems. Um, so I think the players are there. It's just tap, tapping into the right markets. I'll give you an example. Two years ago, we, we, we had the toilet in rugby league set up and there were some dramas 
So I go to Bangkok and I meet the sports minister to iron out the difficulties that we've had. I went over with uh, two people, Peter Thompson and uh, Jeff Bombell, and they help you know, facilitate the meeting with the sports ministry in Thailand. And then they said, listen, we're going to take you up to Chiang Mai area and um, we're going to do a rugby league event. Right. So I just out of interest said, fly up. Uh, we're, we're up in the northern Thailand somewhere. That we're at a school and there's about 30 kids that have come to the school and we're on the footy field just to do a rugby league clinic session, if you like. Wow. So catching and passing, we're going through some drills and then end up playing a, a minor game and away we go. Yep. So I spent about two and a half hours with these kids and I'll tell you what, there was one boy, 16 years of age, who was that gifted, held the ball correctly, he's running, he was like a Steve Rogers, he reminded me of a Steve Rogers, just gifted, yep. show and go, good on his feet. I said, if I bring, take that kid back today, any Harold Matthews or SG Ball team playing in the Sydney Cup, he would walk into the fullback role. That's how good he was. Yeah. Now if, if you could find that in a two-hour session with 30 kids in, in northern Thailand, imagine how many you can find in India. Yeah, absolutely. Well, another, another example, Taz, I, when I, I worked for the London Scholars uh, back in 2009, and we had a young kid, only been playing rugby league for a year, from a very uh, rough area of London. Um, so it was a good avenue for him to get away from the gang life, etc. cetera, so a positive focus yeah. for him. His name was Andre Vine. Uh, he played for the London Scholars top team at the age of 17. And I was, I was thinking to myself, I've got to get this kid to Australia. He'd walk into any SG ball team. Um, he was just, just a natural, naturally gifted athlete. He was six foot four. Uh, it's about 115 kilo when he was 17. I'm sure there's some big kids around in, in Sydney. You know, there's some, there are. There are some big athletes, but this kid was fantastic. And um, I don't know if he's still in the game at the moment. I haven't seen his name anywhere, but yeah, there's some, some gems out there. They're just, just waiting to be yeah. found. And in India, there's, there's talented athletes for sure. As long as we're patient, we go and identify kids, we put them through the system, the protocols that we have in place, I'm, I'm sure we'll find more than just one diamond, we'll find many diamonds. So just for all the uh, viewers out there, uh, if we get to a thousand subscribers on our channel, we'll, we'll buy a hundred footies and we'll get them out to some of these nations that really need their footies. So please like and subscribe to this channel and we'll get some footies out there So uh, to places that Taz mentioned. Okay, so Taz, my next question. Um, so 2013 World Cup over in England, I was living in England at the time. Um, you'd have to say it was a success. It made, it made a profit. Crowds were great. I think the final was a world record for a rugby league international. Uh, 2017, um, I was lucky enough, I was working with the USA Hawks and it was a fantastic experience. Um, I, went to, I was lucky, privileged enough to go to Papua New Guinea to see what uh, rugby league means to them and geez, I, I, I'd, never, I'd never experienced that in my life. What, like our team bus, we had kids chasing us for kilometres down the street. It felt like we've, we all felt like movie stars. Mm. It was unbelievable but, uh, and such a great experience. Um, so you'd have to say the 2017 World Cup uh, was a big success. It made profit for the game um, to, to fund um, you know, international rugby league staff. Uh, so what, what, with, with the COVID situation going on at the moment, what are your thoughts on the 2021 Rugby League World Cup? Do you think it will go ahead? Um, if, you, if it does go ahead, will there be crowds? Well, I think it, oh, it, feel like it's a, a fluid question. Like it, it, our, The rules here in Australia at the moment change weekly, change even daily depending on an outbreak. It's a tough call. The new strain that's come up in the UK and now there's a different strain in South Africa. We'll keep getting mutations of this COVID strain or, or virus. If, if it does go ahead, I, I can see it being played, but I can see it being played without any crowds, only because it's going to be heading in towards the winter period in the UK. All the games are going to be in England. Um, the French didn't manage to... Well, the English government have funded or given a, a, a substantial funding package to Rugby League World Cup 2021. Yep. And all the games are there. It's the first time we have... Well, not the first time. We had 16 teams in 2000. Well, we had you know, four pools of four. And then we had t 10 in 08. Then we had 12 for the last two. And so they expanded everything. And then, and then it's expanded because of the profit that... that so 08 made a, a profit, 13 made a profit, 17 made a profit. 
And with the projected revenue income of, of 21, we should make a profit and be able to expand further. So 16 teams and a lot of, some new teams too, some entertaining teams. A lot of people will be you know, amazed to see how the Jamaicans will play. Absolutely. They, the Greeks. Ah, oh, the Greeks will be there. Some exciting teams. Absolutely. And new, new, to, new to the sport. Yeah. The game's developing in those countries and, and people just want to know well, how, how good are these players. A lot of the players will come out of the, either the Super League or some Australian, but there'll be a number of domestic players that will try to try and score a professional contract with some of the professional clubs. So they'll be trying real hard uh, to do their best. But I, th I think with the current pandemic, um, it, it's a toss of the coin, mate. You don't know whether, first, they're going to be playing. Secondly, if they do play, whether they're going to have crowds. If they don't have crowds, you, you'll take a hit on, on income revenue because ticket sales are an important component to the bottom line. And I think in March, we'll know whether it goes ahead. And then in, if it does go ahead in October, it'll only be in October that you'll know whether you can have crowds or not. Yeah. Because you don't know whether the pandemic will get worse or not. But even with the vaccination, there's going to be a lot of rule. Will all the players want to be vaccinated? Exactly. You've got people that, uh, that, that don't believe in vaccinations. Um, as, a, as a fan myself, I would have loved to... Uh, I left England in 2008, end of 2018. I haven't been back since. So it would have been my first opportunity to go back and experience a great tournament, but obviously COVID's thrown a spanner in the works. Yeah. So for fans, it's, it's, you know, people can't book their flights. So it's, I don't envy the, the uh, John Dutton and his team. They're doing a great job, but I don't envy them because it's just so up in the air at the moment. Oh, well, can you imagine going through quarantine if, if you have to quarantine? to the event and then coming home from the event, that's going to add another month in terms of cost around what anyone does. So it's going to be a tricky one. Um, I'm glad I'm glad it's their headache, not ours, because they're going to have to deal with it. Mm. And, and then you say, well, and we're so lucky here. We're just so isolated. Um, there's 25 million people. We've got our border security between states. When you go into Europe, there's half a billion people in Europe. And they're crossing borders every day and everybody's transmitting. And mm. I've got a son that's living over there in France and he's either in lockdown or he's out. Every two weeks it changes, so mm. you just don't know. Oh, it's just yeah, so up in the air. Um, so 20, 2020, uh, Taz, there was only one international, one men's international, I should say. There was women's international matches. Uh, it was Germany versus Netherlands. Um, so the Golden Boot Award, it's it's given out to the best international player. Do you think a player from that match, because being the only international game of that year, should it go to one of those players? Well, I think it should because when the Golden Boot Award was expanding, you had nominations from the world. Absolutely. And when you had nominations from the world, everybody's a chance of winning it. Now, obviously, if you came from... From the five major countries, which are, you know, New Zealand, Australia, England, France, Papua New Guinea, you're probably a chance of being, the winner's got a chance of coming from one of those countries yeah. because uh, they play the most. But if you've got a world award and everybody is in there, I reckon they should. But don't forget, there was sort of, there was the world award where the golden boot would go to the best player. But then there was a, another award for an emer emerging best nations of, award. Best emerging nations yeah, player. Yeah, yeah. yeah so, so then you might say, well, listen, the, the best emerging nations player, well, that'll be his award for the Golden Boot. But I think, like you said, nothing was played. Netherlands versus Germany, the best player, he gets the award. Hey, and what a good promotion for the game. The game's in so many... The game has a footprint all across the globe now. Yeah. You know, from Latin America to North America, South Africa, Central Africa, Europe, the Pacific. Why not? Well, funny story on that game, Taz, and um, I'm sure he won't mind me mentioning his name, but I, I worked at Oztag for the last two years, and one of my colleagues is uh, ex-Paramatta player Mick Butner. Mick Butner. And I found out, like, he's, for those that know him, he's in top shape. Like, he looks like he could play NRL. He's just, like, kept himself in really good shape after retirement. He was working for the NRL a while ago, joined Oztag. And anyway, just in conversation, he mentioned that his father is actually German born and raised, has a German accent. I said, I said, Mick, how old are you? And I think, <laughs> I think he said he was 45, 46. And he go, I go, would you, would you 
be interested in playing for Germany if I could tee it up for you. So anyway, he said, he said, what standard is it? And I said, oh, they're all amateur players. They're not professionals. There might be the odd one or two that yeah. might be playing semi-pro or pro. And he said, okay, he said to me, oh, Phil, how do, I, how do I get involved? So I put him in touch with the German rugby league. He was, if COVID didn't hit, Michael Butner would have played in that game against Netherlands. And I, I basically said to me, you know, it'd be great for you, someone with your experience, to teach these German players um, about the game. And I think they'd be better yeah, players for the experience playing with you. Um, so yeah, uh, Mick Butner making his international debut for Germany, it, um, it was a victim of uh, COVID-19, COVID-19, unfortunately. Um, so Taz, going back to International Rugby League for 2021, what is the best outcome for, for International Rugby League? Obviously the World Cup going ahead, um, there was other things in the pipeline. Um, what's, the, what's the best outcome for our sport in 2021? Obviously for World Cup to go ahead if it's possible, and if it doesn't, well then you've got to take the good with the bad. I think that the work that, we're, that has been continuing in these countries that were all over the place needs to probably be reinforced. It's a time where they've got to sort of grow up, consolidate their domestic competitions, you know, do school work, engage kids at school to play footy. Women, the women's games flourishing. There's more women now wanting to play or try the game more than ever before. Absolutely. That's an important vehicle that we've got. Can you imagine showcasing women playing the sport and men saying, well, if they can do it, well, then I can do it too. Yeah. But we've got a lot of Latin American countries now really keen, or Brazil. Brazil are going great it? guns. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They're in, in the Women's World Cup. Um, we've Ca- got Canada, Canada, in Canada yeah. as well. You know, and a lot of, we, we're actually, we haven't got a lot of traction in, in Africa for some reason. They're playing, but we're not assisting them enough as far as I'm concerned. All of them, everyone needs help. They do. You know, the, the big outpost of England and Australia, it, it should be under their watch where they help promote and reinforce the game within their immediate vicinity or in their part of the hemisphere, northern and southern hemisphere, because they're the only ones that have got the know-how, they've got the coaching capacity, they've got the coaching courses, coaching and referee ability. The women's game is flourishing. So I think we've got to keep chipping away at the bottom of the pyramid and build a solid foundation. Because at the moment, all we're doing is pitching up a, fe- a tent mm. in a caravan park and a strong wind will come and blow the whole thing away. So we need to do bricks and mortar and it's got to be solid. Okay, and that sustainability going. Absolutely, absolutely. Otherwise, we'll be having the same conversation in 100 years' time and we will say back to the people who are behind us, say, well, what the hell were you doing at there? Didn't you think about... India being nearly 2 billion people, China, mm. go fish where the fish are. One, one thing, Taz, I, I noticed from being a fan of the NFL, um, they have a, a, a spot on their rosters for an international player. Could you ever see the NRL bringing that in where every uh, team, if they, don't have a, if they have a, a player from a Tier 2 or Tier 3 rugby mm-hmm. league nation, so let's say Manly Seagulls find a, a gun 15-year-old from the Solomon Islands, um, and bring him over, they've got to pay for his visa and, and there's, yeah, yeah. there's expense there. Do you, do you think there is, if, if, that, if that player was salary cap exempt, would that encourage NRL clubs to, to get new players into, into our sport? I think it could, because I think if you look at the example of how, we've, how the Pacific has grown for us, started with one player, then it become two, then it become four, then it become eight, so it's going to exponentially increase. And I think it is a way. And, and after my little ex- experiment with, with Thailand, if that one kid was given the opportunity, I guarantee you heaps of development people would be going over yep. and trying to identify the next Craig Wing, mm. Mm. who's not Thai, by the way. I think he's Chinese, but... No, Phil Pena, I think. Yeah? Oh, I could be wrong. Is he Thai? Don't quote me on that. No, I think, I think Craig Wing was um, half Aussie, half Phil Pena. But, I... but the little halfback at Cronulla whose mother's Laotian. Sean Johnson. Sean Johnson. Mm-hmm. Typical example. His mother's Laotian, and we use Sean Johnson in trying to get the Asian rugby Community. league up and going. Yeah. And uh, important important to have person. So if Sean Johnson can develop, he was probably born in New Zealand, but there are plenty of Sean Johnsons in Thailand that nobody knows about. Absolutely. No, absolutely. Uh, so, so Tads, for those that don't know, you've recently been made redundant by the NRL, which... A lot of us fans were upset about because um, we know how much you do for the game. Um, so, what is next um, for Tazbatiri? 
Well, Tasmatiri is trying to stay relevant. Um, I've been doing this for 36 years, and it's pretty hard to teach an old dog new tricks. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm looking, um, running, running. With the help of the Cabramatta Leagues, we're going to run the Sydney Nines, which used to be the Cabramatta Nines anyway, but yeah. I thought we need to freshen things up a little bit. Um, COVID, redundancies, um, people looking for work. I'm no different than everybody else, so we're doing the Nines. Uh, I'm doing a little bit of sort of advising, voluntary stuff, it's all voluntary stuff. Oh, the French have got a new board, a new chairman. I saw that. So, um, do, do, you, do you know the, the new, the new uh, chairman? Oh, we've had, we've had a number of conversations, yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, four players that I coached in the French team back in 1985 and 86 are on the board as well. Right. And uh, I really focused on knowing how the game slipped. So asking advice on, you know, coach education, referee training, um, squads, academy squads, what do they do at training, building an academy. Um, you, you don't really need an academy building because any building can just put the weights in there and, 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 and keep them whiteboard. So yeah, I've been doing a fair bit of advising Mm. Um, just to stay relevant and um, hopefully something will come up there's some government funding that the NRL sort of applies for for work in the Pacific could, oh, I'm waiting, waiting to see if anything will pop up could we, could we see you back in uh, the coaching ranks perhaps coaching Italy or France down the track um, not coaching uh, right now because it, it's, a, it's an art that you need to constantly be updated on and doing all the time. You know, people yeah. like Wayne Bennett, Craig Bellamy, Timmy Sheens, um, you know, Trent Robinson. You know, there's plenty of examples that you've got to be doing consistently for a long period of time because it changes as well. Yeah, Rules absolutely. change, players change. You go through a recruitment of new young up-and-comers to the people that are fading out. You're Cameron Smith. But anyway, now coaching's uh, gone now, but I, I think doing what I've always been doing, connecting people, um, providing equipment, advice, uh, get competitions started. Ha having, having, we've got this uh, league here in Sydney, yeah, the Heritage League, where kids from heaps of races, whether it be Tongans, Samoans, Thai, Asians, Indians, all over the place, yep. play, play for their heritage. Uh, and it's something that's growing all the time, building up also numbers for... for for, the, for New South Wales Rugby League, Queensland Rugby League. People come and try and play the game, girls playing the game. So I think our focus or my focus now is sort of, if I can, keep doing what I have been doing. I'm doing it unofficially. But I'm just trying to make sure that the game is left in a better spot when I leave than when I started. Yeah. And that should be the same philosophy for other people in the game that work in the game. You come in at a level, you want to improve it, and then when you go, you say, well, shit, that's happened because I was responsible for it. But anyway, that's another story. I'm not the only one, and there's plenty more out there that have suffered the same consequences. So, Taz, um, just want to thank you for your time. Um, my last question. Uh, so, you're 36 years in the game. What was your most memorable moment? My most memorable moment, I, I would still go back to having the balls to take three Aussie teams to Moscow, wow. all under 16 years of age, and then managed to convince five other stupid teams to come to Moscow <laughs> so that we could have a tournament. And, you know, can you imagine oh, going, yeah. going to Russia and being in Red Square and playing at the Olympic Stadium? Wow. We played at the Olympic Stadium, artificial turf. Unbelievable. <laughs> and kids are coming back with graces. What are all these graces <laughs> So we played on this artificial turf, third generation artificial turf. A lot of them so, would never, back in those days, would never have played on them. No, nah, like never, yeah. never, never. But anyway, that, I think that, that set a, a, a course for other things that branched out from the tree. And um, yeah, I, and still a lot of kids that went on that trip, and even coaches, go back and say, well, how good was that? Like, yeah. the start of a journey. And then kids develop. And, but anyway, I thought... That was um, a really cool milestone. There's plenty of others, but to do something uh, as bullish as that in a country that doesn't speak, that doesn't have English as a 
not like going to France and maybe the waiter can speak English. <laughs> but in Russia, it's just Russian. And there's KGB all over the place and Earth Square. <laughs> and you're drinking vodka like you're drinking water because it was, it was in summer. Wow. But I've gone, been back in February where it's been minus 40 there. Like, wow. It's just incredible. Oh, that's unbelievable. Wow. But wow. there's been plenty of, um, plenty of personalities along the way. It was good. It's been good. We could, we could chat for hours, Taz, but uh, no, thanks so much for your time and um, thanks for being on the episode. Appreciate it, Phil. Thanks a lot.